Hey, and next up, a follow-up visit to the show. We've asked Professor of Psychology at Northwestern University, Dan McAdams, who wrote a psychological profile on Donald Trump in the Atlantic Monthly magazine to come back and explain what appears to be a Trump meltdown since he clinched the GOP nomination. What happened? Is the race over before it started? Has Trump self-destructed? And Dan McAdams, the Henry Wade Rogers Professor of Psychology at Northwestern. He's the author of George W. Bush and the Redemptive Dream, a Psychological Portrait and the Art and Science of Personality Development. And his recent cover story was in the June Atlantic Monthly Magazine, and that was entitled The Mind of Donald Trump, A Psychologist's Guide to an Extraordinary Personality. Welcome back, Dan. It's great to be back. Thanks. We didn't expect to have you back so quickly, but uh, the world changes quickly. And uh, just uh, to put this meltdown in perspective, uh, we had him uh, winning the nomination while Hillary still had a month to go, uh, mired in a quagmire with Bernie. And since that time, uh, he's actually fought with some of the Republican leadership, Paul Ryan, John McCain. He's attacked the Mexican judge on the Trump University case, the Gold Star Muslim family at the uh, convention who lost a son in the war, the Second Amendment uh, statement where he sort of implied they should go after Hillary where he suggested that Vladimir Putin should uh, hack Hillary's email, calling Obama the founder of ISIS and my personal favorite, throwing a crying baby out of one of his uh, his rallies. Tell us, has he imploded, or has he just worn out his welcome? Maybe a little bit of both. I have to say I'm a little bit surprised. Uh, I thought he would pivot a little bit to uh, kind of become a somewhat more mainstream kind of candidate, mm-hmm. both in style and in substance. But we really haven't seen that. I mean, every once in a while he'll, he'll give a speech and stay on point, and then the next day uh, craziness uh, breaks out. Uh, throwing the baby and the mother out, that might have been the worst. Actually, I thought the turning point for me was his going after Mr. and Mrs. Khan. I, yeah. I was just shocked by that. Um. The, has has his strengths really become his weaknesses? And and, and I think uh, in the most recent piece you did a follow up yourself that you said that the more Trump's told to act presidential, the more erratic his behavior is. And I wonder since he's always been his own boss, if he just doesn't can't stomach anybody trying to tell him what to do. Yeah, I think there's something to that. Uh, he, you know, he has a shtick that has worked very well for most of his life. In fact, it's more than a shtick. It's, it's what he is. It's who he is. He is an impulsive, big-talking, straight-shooting kind of guy who makes a big impact. And although, you know, he's had a spotty record in the business world, this style has gotten him the successes that he has gotten. And it worked pretty much in the GOP race. I mean, on the small stage of Republican voters, he carried the day. But now he's on a much bigger stage in a much more complicated kind of venue, and this isn't playing well. And I think I would have expected him to tamp it down a bit, to try to kind of appeal to more conventional Republicans and maybe independents, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it it just hasn't happened. I mean, he seems to have doubled down on uh, the impulsivity, the lashing out, the aggressiveness. Uh, It's gotten even more extreme since he clinched. An interesting uh, thing, to, I read that Ron Fournier, who's a political analyst, analyst we've had on, said that he thinks that Trump has been made and destroyed uh, by the media in that he's been feeding them so many, let's say, myths to be nice, his net worth, his success, his sexual prowess, whatever you want to talk about, for so long that now that he's getting these this, this sort of negative, that he's like a heroin addict and, and almost can't deal with it. Well, you know, it's sort of... You win by the media and you, and you die by the media. I mean, he, the media is responsible for getting him the nomination in the first place. I mean, he's, he hasn't had to spend a lot of money. He's gotten free media attention all along. And, you know, that media attention is now turning on him. And, now, and you can see that he's going after the media now. Uh, so there is, uh, there is a sense in which things that have worked for him in the past have turned around to hurt him. But I think, you know, that this is to be expected. I think most candidates, both Democrat and Republican, you know, when they win the nomination, sort of know that they're playing on a different stage Mm -hmm. after they win and that they have to change. You know, you saw Reagan do it. You see Clinton did it. George W. Bush. I mean, every successful candidate, and even the ones who weren't successful as presidential candidates, when they get the nod from their party, they try to, you know, they change things. They try to uh, broaden their support. And it seems like every day Donald Trump works harder and harder to get those diehard supporters that he's already gotten. 
I mean, I th- how many outrageous uh, statements do you need to make to get folks who were on your side way back in March? I can't understand if it's, uh, and then I'll, that's all I'll ask you, whether it's because he's so naive about politics. I mean, he actually appears to be dumb in the way to run a campaign. Or uh, I think you said as well in this piece that um, it, he's sort of in a psychological trap which he cannot escape. Uh, and what do you mean that by that? Yeah, the trap is, is uh, something that uh, became clear to me over the last month. I didn't really talk about it back in, when I wrote the Atlantic piece, but it sort of goes like this. I mean, he's, we kind of wonder, why does he always take the bait? You know, when he's provoked, why does he uh, lash out? Why doesn't he just hold back? So I think there's three reasons. I mean, the first is, by nature, he's an angry, impulsive person. So he tends to think quickly and act quickly, you know, I mean, that, that's been his M.O. all along. As I like to say, he lives in the angry moment. So there's that part. But then the second part is it, it gets worse when the, uh, the stimulus or the thing that he's responding to is about him, okay? It's about the self. And this is where the narcissism comes in, the narcissistic goals. He becomes even more impulsive and angry when the self is threatened. And so that kind of makes him double down. And then there are moments where he actually is able to step back and say, okay, I'm not going to be impulsive right now. I'm going to consider the situation in a more reasoned way. And when he does that, I think he comes around to the same response because he has a philosophy of life, well thought out and reasoned, and it goes basically like this. The world is a dangerous place. People are attacking you all the time. You have got to hit back even when it's Mr. and Mrs. Khan, even when it's a baby, you have got to hit back. So his philosophy of life tells him you've got to be a counterpuncher or you won't win in life. So it's, you know, he's kind of, there's three different things going on, and the end result in each case is he lashes out. And it seems like it's impulsive. Sometimes it is impulsive in the moment. At other times, it's a reasoned response. I mean, he, must, he made a reasoned response to hire this new uh, CEO for his campaign, who, uh, coming from Breitbart uh, uh, organization there, is a flamethrower. I mean, Mm -hmm. it sounds like Trump's going to become even more of a flamethrower going forward. He has this counterpuncher sort of philosophy and approach that, A, you're saying he almost can't control, uh, but B, he doesn't, uh, he can't discriminate between big issues and little issues or focusing on Hillary versus little issues? Yeah, he, you know, he writes about this in The Art of the Deal, you know, almost 40 years ago. Uh, he says, you know, it doesn't matter who hits you. You know, it, it can yeah. be a big shot. It could be somebody who's really worth your time and effort. Or it can just be some little Joe Schmo on the street. You've always got to hit back. There, so, I mean, this, maybe this works in the business world in some situations. It, may, it probably doesn't work all that often. But it's sort of enshrined as, as his philosophy of life. And so... <laughs> I mean, it's just pretty extraordinary that he he manages to go after people who, if he just ignored them, in many cases, it would be fine. I mean, the cons are a perfect example. They stole the moment. They had the moment there at the Democratic Convention. When you see something like that happening, you say, okay, they had their moment. I'm just going to sit back here. These folks lost their son. They're good patriots. But he goes after them. He doesn't just go after them once. He continues to go after them. Yeah, and then he says he's, he's suffered and sacrificed. Oh Does, is it, is it uh, meaningful or profound that the, the guy that uh, co-authored the Art of the Deal with him now calls him a sociopath? I think it's meaningful, yeah. Um, I don't know if I would say it's profound. I'm not sure I would use that term, but I, mm-hmm. did, I think it was revealing. Uh, so it's Tony Schwartz, I believe, is the name. Yes. So it turns out they, I had always thought they kind of wrote that book together, but to hear Schwartz tell it, he wrote the whole darn thing and basically was trying to channel Trump. And I think he channeled him you know, pretty accurately. And now, 40 years later, Mr. Schwartz sort of has, uh, not buyer's remorse, seller's remorse, I guess, because he feels like he sold a false bit of goods, or to put it in a different metaphor, that he kind of created through that book a monster, a kind of <laughs> Frankenstein. There may be something to that. I mean, that's the only book Trump's ever written that's, that's any good, that actually has an impact and that people read and has, made a big, uh, has had a big influence. So I think it is interesting when Schwartz says that. I, I'm not sure, you know, sociopaths a little extreme. I mean, that's somebody who has, like, no understanding of right and wrong and mm-hmm. so on. I'm not sure I would say that about Mr. Trump. But, I mean, the impulsivity and the fighting back 
uh, that's that's the problem I think he has now. All right, we're down to the final minute. Let me ask you this. It seems to me that this guy has a complete lack of self-awareness and does a lot of projection. And when, I, when, I, when I see him calling Lion Ted or that Hillary's unhinged or unstable, I mean, don't those really append closer to him? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, the pot calling the kettle black, yeah. right? I mean, you know, he'll, he'll use terms that uh, seem to be kind of coming straight out of his own yeah. his own personality. There is a lack of self awareness. There's also a kind of lack of depth. I mean, you yeah. know, it, people yeah. have not been able to find much beyond the surface <laughs> when it comes to Donald Trump. Yeah, you're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell, flagship station, Yale Radio, WYBC, and WGCH Greenwich. In our last national segment, uh, we'll talk uh, about several things, including how Trump will deal with losing. And our guest, Dan McAdams, and we're talking about Donald Trump. Uh, before we get into the, the, the sort of the uh, where we're at now, let me just ask you this. You see this pattern, and I, I hate to use the word con, but so much of his stuff, there's a lot of hype, and then there's under-delivery, uh, under not in touch with details. We saw that, obviously, in Trump University. Just yesterday, I read there was something called Trump Magazine, a luxury brand magazine, and he was being paid $120,000 a month licensing fee at the same time that the staff's checks we're bouncing. Wow. And how does he, I mean, the, how does he, if he's going to license, wouldn't he be associating himself with less sleazy, you know, entities? Yeah, I don't understand that. I mean, it's almost as if he doesn't have any standards on this sort of thing. I mean, yeah, he, exactly. you know, the Trump name is supposed to mean quality and trust yeah. and all that. Uh, but if you're extending it to those kind of situations, uh, you kind of wonder. Okay, uh, let's talk about this now. And the, under the guise of is the race over before it started, he seems to be at a ceiling of 40 percent. 19 percent of GOP uh, voters want him to drop out. 44 percent totally want him to drop out. And if you do the math, that means he'd need 94 percent of the rest of the voters to get to 50 percent. Millennials are 52 to 26 percent. Hillary, is he is he doomed? Is it is it is he mathematically finished already? I don't know. I mean, I think you need somebody like Nate Silver and Nate Cohn to make those kinds of projections. I think they're, you know, right now it's looking like a well, something like a 90% probability that Hillary will win. But, you know, 90% probability isn't 100, and that's a 1 in 10 chance at this point, and things can always change. Yes. You know, sometimes world events happen, kind of hijack it all. But I have to say, I, again, I'm surprised that he hasn't done better that he hasn't moved more to the center to try to broaden the base. It does seem like he's doubling down on the supporters that he has, and there just aren't enough of them. Okay, let's ask uh, this question. He seems to be, as we've, we've always said, as you've always said, obsessed with winning, whatever it takes. How would he deal with losing, um, uh, and are we sort of seeing that right now? And, and, and there's some comments now where he's actually talking about losing. Yes, it's interesting. Uh, one thing I've said about him before is that I've always felt like most people – who run for president, they want to win the election in order to be president. But Donald Trump wants to be, uh, you know, wants, wants to be uh, president in order to win the election. And that it's really ultimately all about winning. And the idea of being the president is almost like an afterthought. But it is starting to lose. It look like he might lose. And how will he react to that? In the past, when he's had setbacks like bankruptcies and so forth, he's kind of reframed the conversation. He's changed the terms. He's changed the subject. I don't know how you do that when you when you lose one on one against Hillary Clinton. Uh, you know when the when the votes come in. Uh, I just don't know how you do it. I, I see him now saying things like, well, you know, if I lose Pennsylvania, and by the way, I think he's down 12 points in Pennsylvania. If I lose Pennsylvania, you know it's got to be rigged. Rigged, okay? yeah. Uh, and, uh, or they cheated, and you've got to get out there. So that's part of it. But uh, it, it's still a mystery. I mean, uh, I, I just, uh, I'm baffled. Really. Is there anything in his, in his MO, psychological MO, that would uh, have him do something like quit? And say that he didn't, I don't have the support of the Republicans and blah, 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 and I'm, and I'm walking out the door. Ultimately, he makes all his decisions on his self-interest. Yes, yes. I have heard that theory uh, before. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, you'd think you'd go down in history then as the quitter. But, you know, is that worse than going down as the guy who lost? Right. A, goal, uh, the, a gold girl, water the woman. type. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't rule it out totally. I have heard some Republican uh, experts suggest they think there's a chance that he might step down before the election if it looks like he's really in bad shape. 
Uh, it would be an unprecedented, extraordinary kind of thing to go. I guess I think he won't do that. I haven't seen him do that before and stuff, but then there's never been anything quite this dramatic, whereas, you know, you either win or lose and everybody's going to know. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard, hard to kind of predict, but I think he'll stick it out. Uh, and if he loses, uh, he said he's going to go on a vacation. I find that hard to believe. I think he will probably talk about how, uh, he was robbed. Well, let me talk about two other things that, and see what you think if they could be white. Number one, that this is all designed, uh, and the Breitbart guy falls right into this when he's finished to open up Trump TV or Trump media. Yeah, uh, I, up until today, I would have said that that's not likely, uh, that I think Trump wants to win the election to win the election, um, mm-hmm. and that he, there aren't these other motives. But, uh, th- you know, there's an interesting article today on that uh, and opening up possibilities. So it may be that he is thinking a little bit about the post November life, uh, if he indeed loses. I think, though, the choice of this uh, fellow from Breitbart was uh, mainly to get somebody who's got the same kind of temperament and uh, yeah. that he's got and to really go after Hillary in a much more aggressive way than he's done already, although he's been pretty aggressive. That's the funny thing of this is, uh, to me, I see it as he wants to get back to what Corey Lewandowski did, which is let Trump be Trump. Yeah. But let Trump be Trump is almost a guaranteed formula for losing in the general. Well, you know, and they, you know, Trump has been being Trump the whole time. So, I mean, he's got this narrative going now that, well, you know, Corey's gone and Manafort's been my guy for yeah. the last couple months, and I have been kind of constrained. But he hasn't been constrained. I mean, he's been more outrageous than <laughs> he was before. So I don't know what let Trump be Trump means. I don't know how he can get any more Trump. Um, there's another theory that I've read, and this one I don't really buy because it would not involve him being more somewhat selfless and but it's that, that he's actually building a movement, yeah, this nationalistic, protectionist, authoritarian. Yeah. You know, the, there was the Know Nothing Party in the U.S. that was anti-immigrant. There was the American First during World War II. Fran- you know, there's right-wing parties in some of these countries that he's actually building a more of a longer-term deal. I think he is, but I don't think he knows he's doing that. It's not his <laughs> goal, but that, is, could, that could be the result. And I think that that's a very interesting and potentially dangerous development in American society. Trump may be gone after November 9th or whenever the election is, but Trump supporters, the hardcore Trump supporters, they're not going anywhere. And they have been given voice for maybe the first time in a long time. This is a very strong movement in this country, Mm -hmm. and I think it's going to change the political landscape. So it may be that Trump is the unwitting sort of leader of that movement, but I don't, I don't think he has enough interest in politics and ideology yeah. and so forth to, to like, self-consciously. That's, fa- that's fascinating, that. because what you're saying is he's not going to hang around to run it. No. Okay. No, somebody else yeah. will step up. Because I think that definitely is what's going to happen. I mean, the, the elections are going to get more and more contentious, right? Yeah. I, I mean, until... So. And, until this, and, and, and those are voters that both parties are going to have to deal with in one way or another, assuming the Republican Party survives this. Wow, that's pretty profound stuff. Uh, in just a couple of seconds, normally the campaign doesn't even start to Labor Day, so you can say we're still in preseason if you want. Uh, psychologically, do you think that, there, that he could turn things around once we go into the major league part of the campaign? I, no, I no. don't think so. I, I, I think we've been in the major league. I mean, you know, that old Labor Day thing, that's the way it used to be. Uh, we've been in full bore mode now for at least a month, and he hasn't been able to turn it around. I thought he would. He didn't. I don't see how he's going to do it now, especially with the latest move with this new leader for his, uh, his um, candidate. You know? Well, it's the second time we've had Dan, and it's always been incredibly insightful. And, uh, and if the thing uh, is able to sustain itself, we may have to get you back in the remaining uh, 90 days. That June Atlantic monthly cover story, again, was The Mind of Donald Trump, a psychologist guide to an extraordinary personality. It's been Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Our next show, we've got a rebuttal on our recent interview with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., his claim that his cousin Michael Skakel was innocent. We've got two experts that will rebut some of his claims. Thanks to Dan McAdams. Thanks to our national audience for listening. See you next Sunday on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. All right, uh, and thanks to Dan McAdams. He's agreed to stay on for our segment five overtime for a bit uh, because he wanted to switch psychological profiles And as you remember, uh, his book, George W. Bush and the Redemptive Dream, A Psychological Portrait and the Art and Science of Personality Development, it's a great follow-up to an interview we just did with one of the leading presidential historians, Gene Edward Smith, uh, who's just written a book and uh, with a very strong um, caveat that the Iraq 
and Iran and Afghanistan wars were the biggest foreign policy blunders in American history, which is really quite a statement. And he links it directly to um, the messianic fervor that George W. Bush uh, brought to try to bring democracy to the world. And I wanted to, th- I thought it'd be a great balance to see what Dan's, uh, how that fits with Dan's psychological profile in his book. Right. So uh, I, I would say, Jim, that, uh, that there is some alignment there. I mean, first of all, I, I think it's, it's true that George W. Bush was the decision maker in this whole thing, at least with respect to launching the preemptive invasion of Iraq. I mean, I don't think it was you know, Cheney or Rumsfeld. They were supportive. He surrounded himself with people who wanted to do this, with the exception of Colin Powell. But uh, he was the decider, to use his term. Mm-hmm. Uh, second... I think his religious uh, conversion, becoming a born-again Christian around the age of 38, 39, this was one of the most profound things that happened in his life. It's a central feature or turning point in his life narrative. Uh, Messianic is probably too strong, uh, but I think George W. Bush uh, saw himself as doing the Lord's work to a certain extent. He really believed in, I think, a very positive way in the power of democracy and freedom. Uh, and he went into this uh, with part with that as part of his motivation, but there was also other motivations. I mean, he wanted to go after Saddam in part because Hussein had been his father's greatest enemy, mm-hmm. uh, and so there's a defending my father kind of piece. Uh, there's uh, there are geopolitical reasons, but there's also this idea that he firmly believed in that America is a beacon for democracy, and we can go in there and we can make a positive difference. Uh, I mean, this is kind of consistent with some of the neocon arguments at the time. Mm -hmm. For some people, these are inspiring arguments. For others, they're just woefully full of folly. And uh, but I I do think that that was part of the motivation. Yes. Okay. um, Now he feels, Gene uh, Smith, that this essentially the net result of this is destabilization of the Middle East, the rise of ISIS, and and um, the the breaking of the Sunni um, Shia schism that Saddam managed to, through basically fear, uh, keep under control. So when you attach this fervor to deliver democracy, um, and that's the outgrowth of it, is it fair to call it the biggest foreign policy blunder in history? I don't know my history well enough, but I think in my lifetime, I would say that the invasion of Iraq in March of 2003 was the greatest uh, foreign policy disaster that, that I've witnessed. Uh, I, I kept, during when it was going on, I kept thinking, well, this isn't really going to happen. He's not really going to do this. Uh, and it happened, and it's actually turned out to be worse, I think, even than uh, those who feared it uh, thought it might be. So you, so it does relate. Okay. Uh, is your book, by the way, um, a, a fundamentally a positive uh, view of Bush's uh, uh, psychology? It, it's probably uh, neutral to slightly negative. Yeah, I mean, okay. it, it's, a, it's a short uh, treatise on trying to explain the psychological reasons for Bush's decision mm-hmm. to go into Iraq in 2003. And I get into his traits and his uh, relationship with his father, uh, but there's also this business about uh, the, uh, his religious conversion and how that supported it, and the story he had about his life. I think uh, Bush kind of projected his own narrative onto the world, and his narrative was, you know, I was a, I was a loser, I was a drunk, I was out of control for many, many years, and then I got Laura in my life, I found Jesus, I gave up alcohol, I turned my life around, and I regained that freedom and power that I had when I was a kid. In the same way that he felt that he was oppressed by these forces, so too I think that he project that onto the Iraqi people, whom he saw as oppressed by Saddam Hussein. Wow. And so you go in there, you take out the oppressor, you restore freedom and liberty, as, uh, as Bush saw them as God-given uh, sort of rights that people have, and all is good. So if I can, if I can put, if I can uh, uh, get past my alcohol and I can get God in my life and turn things around, surely America, the strongest country in the world, can go into Iraq and turn it around. I know this. George W. Bush says to himself because it worked for me personally, and so it should play out on the national stage. He couldn't imagine that that it wouldn't work out that way. But indeed, it, it hasn't worked out that way. That's interesting, and it's almost kind of sad because it's a very optimistic... Uh... It's very sad. Yeah, when I went into writing the book on Bush, I didn't expect to kind of come to this conclusion. Uh, I ended up feeling sad for him, but also just sadder for us because it, it was certainly a disastrous thing. Do you think, uh, from Bush's perspective, he, he feels at peace with himself because he followed his convictions? Yeah, I think so. Um, 
he's not a guy that second second guesses himself right. very right. much. Uh, so, and that's just not going to change. Uh, he, he's probably taking the long run view. He's probably thinking sooner or later this will be vindicated. Yes. I did my best, um, and and you know, I mean, I kind of respect him in a way for that. On the other hand, his inability to see other points of view and to bring into his cabinet yep. dissenting voices was a real problem in that administration. Um, it, it, this is a good flow through your description of he had this this internal uh, you know narrative for his life and the meaning of his life and the transformation. You've said uh, both here and the, our first interview that that that's thematically underdeveloped in Trump. Yeah. And I, I, I want you to talk a little bit about that, because I still find that a little surprising, because nobody has created more of a myth about himself. Good point. Uh, it, I, I expected when I went into the Trump work, and, and, and you know, I didn't spend as much time with Trump. It was a three-month dive, where right. I spent two years with Bush. But uh, in the Trump uh, sto- uh, project, I expected to find something like I found with Bush, and that is some deeper kind of narrative about his life that's really important to him that in some way or another would give us a clue as to what kind of a president he might be. But you don't find much by way of narrative for Trump. True, he has, he has kind of created a myth in the sense that, mm-hmm. you know, he's this big business leader, he's very successful and so forth. He says he's a billionaire, maybe he isn't. So there's a myth in the sense of, like, pulling one on over on the American people. There's right. that kind of sense of a myth. But when you think of a myth in a different way as a deep narrative that has some truth in it, psychological truth, it's hard to find a deep, a deep story for Donald Trump beyond self-promotion and fighting. So he's a warrior. He's a fighter. He's out there to win all the time. But why? Why does he want to win? George W. Bush wanted to win. He wanted to uh, uh, have compassionate conservatism. He wanted to win the war with Iraq and, and restore democracy. I mean, he failed in both of those situations, but he had goals. He had a narrative that I think guided him in office, for better and for worse. In Trump's case, it's just much more of a mystery because we don't have a story behind the behind the role, at least not much of one. Interesting, and that and that's where you get your conclusion that he really would be clueless in the Oval Office. Exactly. Very interesting. Um, one one more thing, then, and this ties them all together. You can say Clinton, George W. Bush, Donald Trump all share some pretty strong narcissism. W- when does narcissism become malignant? Uh, it's hard to know when mar- narcissism becomes malignant, but if you want to talk about the three of them, yeah. uh, I, I, I do think that Donald Trump, uh, again, wins, wins the race by a mile on narcissism over George W. Bush and Hillary Clinton. I'd probably put Hillary and George W. about at the same level, maybe Hillary a little higher. But, but you know, Bush is just, I mean, excuse me, Trump is a narcissist of a kind of different magnitude uh, in terms of putting himself out there all the time. And everything is about him, refers to him. Uh, you, you, you've got to have some of that to run for office, especially at, at the level of a president. I mean, that's, that's really an extraordinary thing to try to achieve. Uh, so we don't, you know, it's not surprising to see that in candidates. But Trump takes it to a different level. Um, a narcissistic personality disorder, it, it, would that, um, that diagnosis, would you say that a person with that should not be president or not? Um, I, I shy away from diagnosis. I'm not a, a psychiatrist, and I right. sort of actually don't even find those diagnoses to be all that useful. Okay, that's how I, I think there, there are reasons to, uh, to fear Donald Trump as a president. Uh, that go beyond that. I mean, his, his narcissistic goals are a problem, mm-hmm. but uh, I think the uh, you know the impulsivity, the, the extravagant claims, all these kinds of things, which really aren't exactly narcissism, his inability to tell the truth. Yes, uh, these are bigger problems. Well, where does that come from? The pathological lying. If I mean, I read that there's this Goldwater thing. You can't make psychological uh, diagnoses. But when somebody's a pathological liar, that um, what what does that mean? It's some, it's I don't going know on. what it means actually. I mean, I, it, it, the term pathological refers to illness, and it's a medical term. Okay. Uh, and and I try not to use those terms in doing psychological okay. commentary on public figures. But he lies about everything. He, he lies uh, uh, probably 80 percent of the time, yeah, right. at least according to PolitiFact. Uh, I don't know where it comes from, but it is, it's, it's something that's consistent. I mean, it goes way back. It's a characteristic of people who are low on the trait agreeableness. Is he aware of it? doesn't really explain it. That just lumps it together with a lot of other characteristics. Is, is he aware of it? I mean, how does someone who lies 80 percent of the time, you know, describe somebody else as a liar? 
It's, it's, it's interesting. With I a think, straight uh, face. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how he does it. I mean, it may be that he's saying that Hillary's hiding things, whereas he doesn't hide anything. Mm-hmm. He just lies all the time, although he is hiding his taxes, isn't he? So, yeah, I don't, I don't quite know how, do, how Donald Trump like, uh, justifies these things, or if he even does. Does he know uh, he's lying? I think he's always in the moment, and he's not reflecting back yeah. to kind of consider the fact that 80% of the time I'm lying here, gee, I wonder what that means about me. I'm not sure he asks himself that kind of question. <laughs> but just, uh, you know, a, a big picture question. The mind of Donald Trump, uh, risk, reward, uh, is pride going to go with before the fall? Where do you come down? I think pride often does, often, almost always go with before the fall, especially in politics. Uh, and so I, you do see a kind of a scenario here where he's setting himself up for a huge failure. If the failure isn't losing the election, the failure could be a disastrous presidency. Interesting. Now, I want to pursue this because I'm not sure I totally understand it. Presidents have narratives of their lives, which are critical. He's George W. Bush, his transformation at midlife. You say that uh, Trump's narrative is thematically underdeveloped. What does that mean? Yeah. So most of us have a story about how we came to be who we are, and that story is an important part of our personality. It's behind the traits. And in in the case of Bush, in the case of Obama, there were narratives that they they lived by that defined who they were, and these narratives have had an effect, for better and for worse, on how they occupied the office. In Donald Trump's case, it is very difficult to find the story behind the role. To the extent I could find anything, it was a, a very simple story about a, a warrior, a man who fights, who learned to fight from his father very early on because the world is a dangerous place. But that, you know, fighting why? What, what ideals uh, do, does fighting promote? There isn't any, anything beyond that. There isn't any answer to that particular question. So the story that he has about himself is this almost simplistic comic book kind of superhero story. Yeah, we might have that when we're 18, but the man's 69 and he's running for the highest office in the land. You would expect a more nuanced, psychologically sophisticated narrative. Does he have a complete lack of self-awareness? Is there a there there? And you bring up the question that who are you when you're alone should be answerable to some degree. It's the central question of the piece. And I thought when I started writing it, when I started working on it, that I would find more there there, that there would be some kind of narrative behind the actor that helps us understand how Donald Trump sees himself. And the closest you can get to it is that he sees himself as a fighter. But that's not much of a narrative there. So I think when you get behind the role, and he's always playing the role. It's Donald Trump playing Donald Trump. When you get behind the role, it's hard to find much of substance. Mark Singer wrote a New York profile, a New Yorker magazine profile, and in there he has a great sort of term. The exist, uh, Trump appears to have an existence unmolested by the rumblings of a soul. How would you interpret that? It's a beautiful quote, and it's why I started the article with that. And I, 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 my initial attempt was to find the soul, and I ended up thinking that Singer is probably right. Although I don't use the term soul, uh, but I would use the term uh, a, a story, a narrative identity behind the, behind the thing. And there just doesn't seem to be a story there behind the role. So uh, the point I think Singer's trying to make is this is a man who goes through life always being observed, effectively doing these roles. But when he's not in front of the camera, when he's not with other people, what's back there? You know, who is the Donald Trump? And it's just hard to find much. Is he symptomatic of where we are now that he would be the first reality TV president? Unfortunately, he may be symptomatic as to where we are, at least with respect to reality TV and the whole cult of celebrity that seems to have kind of overtaken uh, America in the Internet and social media age. So in that sense, yeah, I think he's pretty cutting edge. I mean, he's, 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 uh, he's symptomatic of certain kinds of fascinations that we have in our, in our culture. At the same time, there are other things going on, too. And so, uh, you know, I... I yeah, he, but it's clearly, I mean, he, if he does win, I mean, it will be partly because of his starring in reality TV and the idea that he puts on these performances that people love to watch. He's, he's entertaining. Some people vote for him, have said, listen, the other candidates are boring. Now, Mike D'Antonio, who we interviewed, written a book called Never Enough. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that behind the scenes before it came out, and it was just about the time that the Trump people were wanting to go, they wanted him to call the book Make America Great Again. And he, of course, went to Never Enough, which makes your point, I think. Another interesting part, and you can comment on on this, is that um, he interviewed Ivana Trump. And, of course, she was glowing now, as the whole all of them are. But she called him back later. I don't know if this was actually in the book and said that the, the way to look at Donald is he's a child. 
Yeah, I know Ivana has said that and so forth, and she may be onto something. In some ways, he's psychologically undeveloped, and there's certain childlike features about him. Uh, I think D'Antonio's uh, title for the book, Never Enough, gets at the narcissism part, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, this idea that you know, I want to win, I want to win, I want to win, and I can't win enough. Uh, it's actually a brilliant book, by the way. I think that's an excellent biography, and I use, I use it to great effect, I think, in the in the piece. Um, uh, Ivana, she's got mixed feelings. On the one hand, mm-hmm. you know, he's the father of her children, and she did love him and so forth. They had business together. Uh, on the other hand, I think she feels that she knows him well, but I don't know if anybody really knows Donald Trump well, to tell you the truth. I'm not sure anybody has really gotten to the soul there, maybe because there isn't much. Okay. Now, obviously, we've got to put this into a relative uh, uh, position because we don't, we're only given the choice of two candidates, essentially. So, um, obviously, you can't dissect Hillary Clinton, but on the big five, do you put her in some category? Do you put her at a healthier level than Trump? Well, the big five aren't necessarily about health, but uh, there are big differences between uh, her and Donald Trump with respect to the traits, and these are pretty easy to see. You don't have to be a delve deep. Uh, as a social actor, what distinguishes her from others? Probably the fact that she's so conscientious, and I mean this in good ways and sometimes bad ways. People high in conscientiousness are hardworking, achievement-striving, dutiful, responsible, they're always the adults in the room. They're always trying to take charge and so forth. She stands out on that, I think, more than uh, the most presidential candidates would. I think the other four traits don't say much, but for her, conscientiousness stands out. Conscientiousness is a little boring. Uh, it, yeah. It's the kind of thing that uh, you might see from an establishment co- uh, uh, candidate like Hillary Clinton who believes in the system, who wants to work through the system. That's the one trait, I think, that stands out in my mind with respect to the big five and Hillary. That's interesting because uh, she, she does sort of lack an overarching vision or radical or revolutionary type uh, change policies. Have you had any feedback from the Trump com- campaign, and would you expect it to be of the nature of your loser sleazebag? Unfortunately, he hasn't sent me a letter that I could put on my wall. Uh, <laughs> uh, I haven't heard anything. One radio uh, interview I did said that Trump had responded and said he said the article was sad, terrible. <laughs> but I'm not sure that's true. I think maybe the, uh, uh, the guy that was interviewing me made that up. I've got, had no official uh, response from the Trump people. I've had do a lot of responses from people who support Trump, but not from the campaign. Do you, do you think that, that, that he would even read it? I suspect somebody on his staff has read it. Uh, I don't know what he reads. He doesn't talk much about that kind of thing. That's another thing we don't know about him. Uh, he's up at doing stuff all the time, but I don't think he ever sit, kind of kicks back and reads an article or a book. We've had a very fast hour here, and I'll end it with a statement in your, in, in, which you've been talking about, which is fighting to win but never knowing why. Thanks to Professor McAdams of Northwestern University. That June Atlantic Monthly cover story again is The Mind of Donald Trump, A Psychologist's Guide to an Extraordinary Personality. And it's fascinating precisely because it's not a hit piece Uh, You can look at it as a dispassionate piece. Thanks to Dan McAdam. Thanks to our national audience for listening. We'll see everybody next Sunday on Business Talk with Jim Campbell.